right, so Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to try to finish this out since Pastor gave us permission to go till midnight because it's biblical. Um, hey, we're going to finish this. There's not going to be a part four tonight. Just want to let you know. Um, I'm just kidding. We're not going to go that late. But do you remember one of the guys fell and died? Was that in that scenario? Uh, he was up on the second floor or something and, and fell and, and, and died. Um, wow, wouldn't that be crazy? That's why we don't have a balcony here except for our sound booth. Just don't lean over the edge, Carlton, okay? All right. So, and the rest of you too. I wasn't just singling out Carlton there. But Galatians chapter 5, and can we start in verse 16 so we can get the context? Good. I'm glad you agreed with me. Starting in verse 16, it says, This I say then. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That was our base truth, what we were jumping from. If you're walking in the Spirit, you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, in verse 17, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So, that's the base truth. But keep from stifling your true desires that you now have in Jesus Christ. If you are walking in the flesh, you're not doing what you really want to do because of what Christ has done for you. Okay, um, going on into that next verse, verse 18. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. By all means, don't look to the law as your Savior. It was meant as a guide, not as a Savior. And, and it was interesting this morning in Sunday school in Joe Craig's class, uh, if you don't go to his class and, and you're looking for a class, go ahead and go over there. He's going through Romans. And, it, and I believe it was in verse 20 of chapter 5 where it talked about the law. When it came into existence, the sin abounded. Why? Because all of a sudden, because we've seen the guide, the law, all of a sudden we noticed how much we do sin. Okay. It's like uh, when, 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 uh, if you want to find out how many people drink alcohol, add a, the, the, uh, a law that states you shouldn't drink alcohol, you'll find out how many people are drinking alcohol, right? Okay, it, all of a sudden it comes up. I think we already did that, didn't we? Um, and, and, and so we all of a sudden see all the things that are going against the law. It was a guide to help us see. It was like the school teacher. And if you remember by that, not exactly what Jackie Foyle is. It was actually a slave that would follow along with the children and would make sure that they made it to school. They would correct them. They would act as a guide all throughout their childhood years to the point where um, they would be released from this school teacher. Okay, so as you get into that, don't look to the law as your savior because all of a sudden you're just conforming to what the law is. You're not transforming. You're not being transformed as Roman states. Be ye transformed. Okay, which is very, very important. Then you go into fulfilling the flesh is evident. We got through this point, or at least most of it last Sunday night, and we started reading through this. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. It's revealed. You can tell what is sinful and what is not. You can tell. And he goes on and he starts giving this list. Now remember, it wasn't an exhaustive list, but it is several um, sins or works of the flesh that he's labeled off here. Adultery, fornication, so he covers both of those just to, just to help us out. Uncleanness, lasciviousness, and if you remember that, that's like unrestra unrestrained pleasure. There is no restraint, and, and if you... If, if you want an illustration, look at America today. There is not much restraint going on. Um, it, it's, it's, it's interesting, even in um, the field of parenting, how many parents are just seeing that, that as a title versus a verb. You know what I'm saying in that sense? Some parents say, well, I am a parent. 
but yet they don't do anything about it. And then they let their kid out at 1130 at night all by themselves. And I wonder what happens. They're unrestrained because their parents aren't parenting. Have you noticed that? Go to the square. You'll find out how unrestrained teens can be. Remember back when you went to the square, okay? You know, I guess that's the thing in Taylorville, all right? Um, but, but you can find out unrestrained pleasure when, when they're, not, they're not saying no. And in fact, sometimes it's taught that you don't have to say no. Do what you want. Do what you want. I don't know if you remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Steinbart sent out an email um, on their prayer letter and I don't know if any of you read it because nobody called the office and said, what is going on here, okay? Did, did anybody read the Steinbart uh, email and was kind of concerned about what was going on because they started talking about one of their church activities was a traditional circumcision event? Now some of you are like, whoa, I need to read those emails. Okay, in, in that area... Their tradition is for once the boys come of age, their right into manhood is they'll take them all together and go and circumcise all these boys in an unclean way. And then they'll teach them how to be a man, how to treat your wife in a horrible way, get whatever you want, do drugs, go and commit fornication, now, this is not what the church is doing, but this is what the society does in, in Africa. Remember I said this is what they do in Africa, okay? Now, the church has provided a substitute where they will bring in a doctor or at least help uh, them get to a doctor and make sure that it's a clean and safe and sterile event, okay? And then teach them how to biblically be a man. And, and several teenagers got saved through this event, by the way. Kind of a crazy event, and you'd be thrown way outside of your comfort zone in, in this cultural sense, okay? Um, we're not doing that here, folks, okay? Um, but, but in that sense of this unrestrained pleasure and the works of the flesh, they are teaching their children to do it. They're teaching their children. The world is teaching their children, go and enjoy in an unrestrained manner. That's why it's the church's job to step up and say, hey, show some self-control. Why? Because God's word states it. As you go on, it talks about idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Some of your translations might have orgies involved in that, and it goes right along with all the things that I just stated, okay? And so when you, when you deal with all of these things, he says these are revealed as being fleshly, as being sinful. Stay away from these things. Don't let these things come to fruition hinder these things it's something that we battle all the time and he goes on and he says of the which i tell you before as i have also told you in time past so he's already talked to them about this why because it might have been something that they were dealing with already it was probably dominant in their culture as we know of that time period, several of these things would have been very dominant in their culture. And so he's saying, listen, this is a real thing that you need to deal with. I've already told you about this. I'm revisiting this thing. And he says that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what I didn't cover. That last statement I didn't cover last time that we were in this passage. I got home. And my wife was asking me about the passage, and I said, I forgot the last part of the verse, okay? So I, I said, well, at least there's part three, okay? So when, it's, when it states that, it doesn't mean that you've lost your salvation if you've committed one of these deeds. That's not what it's talking about. 
what it's talking about in that statement, that they which do, it is a present continual thing that they're, that it's, it's their way of life. It's, it's, it's a habit that they have continually walked in. Just like I stated uh, about walking in the spirit, there is this consistent present walking, moving forward. This is when they are consistently, habitually involved in these works of the flesh. That is representative of someone who is not a child of God. So if you're here tonight, and this is reflective of your life, you need to ask the question, am I a child of God? Say, you're questioning my salvation? I'm not. I'm just allowing the word of God to affect people that's in this room and on, on live stream. If this is a part of your life, it is very evident that these are a work of the flesh. It is not walking in the spirit. And if this is a part of your life, it will hinder you. It will keep you from walking in the spirit. So check these things out. See what's your habitual way of, of living. What do you consistently run back to? Is it these works of the flesh? Are you a child of God? If you are, Start tonight saying no to your flesh and start saying yes to God. That's the only way that you're going to be moving forward. Say, Pastor, give me a law. No, we've already talked about that. Give me a set of standards that I need to put over my life. Am I trying to conform you or am I allowing the Holy Spirit to transform you? Now, I can, I, can, I can give you some helpful um, hints on how to walk. You know, one of those is to read your Bible. So, well, duh. And yet, how, how much of a struggle is reading your Bible? How, how much of a struggle is, is actually meditating on the Scripture? What about you? You know, I told the teens this, this uh, past Wednesday, I said, the more that I read God's word and actually pay attention to it, the less I am prone to temptation. Have you ever noticed that in your walk? The more you're into Jesus, the less you're into yourself. And so I need to come back and check myself and see where I'm at, see the man in the mirror, and what's the mirror? According to James, it's the, it's, it's the word of God. The perfect law of liberty. Is that the way that it's described in James? The word of God. How do I look into that and, and see myself? Am I, am, I, am I reflecting the image of God? We go on to the next part in the verse 22. And... And we're, we're going to be talking about walking in the Spirit is evident. So the works of the flesh are evident, but walking in the Spirit is evident. You're going to be able to tell. Other people are going to be able to tell whether you're a Christian or not. If people question that, that should put some question marks in your mind. What am I doing to cause them doubt to my walk with God? Or am I even out there evangelizing? Am I out there trying to, to disciple the lost? You say, disciple the lost? Yeah, if you just keep teaching them about the Word of God, just keep teaching them, just like we do our children. We want them to know God. And so we're teaching them the things about God. And our Wednesday nights in the Kids Club, Truth Trackers, they are... They are um, answering questions with scripture. I love it. 
They're going through salvation. They've been in, in dealing with salvation and, and, and that doctrine for several weeks. And, and they've been 10 weeks in and they've memorized scripture um, every week, these verses that answer a question about their God and, and the salvation that he offers. I love it. We're trying to disciple them. We're trying to help them. We're trying to give them that truth. Okay? How, how much are we doing that to those that are around us? I bet you, man, if, if do, you, do you understand how much pull you have in your community? Say, so what are you talking about? How many people do you know in your community? Now, just think of all those people. Say, oh, they're not, there's not that many. Think of all, all of your connections in our community. And then give me their names and numbers and let me call them. And, and say, hey, you know what? Does, does, uh, does Jason, does he act like he's walking with God? Oh, does Michaela, does she, does she act like she's walking with God? Say, mm, I ain't giving you any names or numbers, right? What about your family? Do you care enough about your family to walk with God in front of them? Your friends. Man, some of you, I've gone out to eat with you, and you're saying hi to everybody else. You're wa hey, 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 hey. I wonder if I asked them in that moment, what would they say? Is our, is our light shining? Part of that is when you jump into this, walking in the Spirit should be evident. This is the opposite side of the playing field. In verse 22 it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Let's keep going. Verse 23, Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Let's stop right there. Here he is. He labels out all these fruits of the Spirit. And, and I said fruit singularly for a reason, because that's exactly what it is right there. It's a singular fruit, okay? But then it's also passive. It's passive in the sense that this is not the fruit of self-effort. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Just give me a, a list of things to do. Stop. Love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and might and everything you've got. Let's just, let's just summarize it all. Love God. Know Him. Have a relationship with Him. If you don't have that, then I could give you 10 things to do, but it wouldn't matter. Love your God. Care about Him. It's, it's kind of like this. If, if you were to go and pick fruit, if, if, um, does anybody have any fruit trees in their backyard? Okay, all right. All right, now, now let's, just, let's just use this as, um, uh, let's, let's use a really good illustrator here, okay? Reagan, okay? My daughter, Reagan. She's not, she does not have the ability to climb the tree yet. Okay? All right? Makes sense, doesn't it? So if she wants a, 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 a bright red apple, she's going to need to ask someone who is capable of bestowing that fruit to her, correct? So who she's going to ask? Well, hopefully it's dad, right? But if you're close, children are known to ask other people, especially mine. And, 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 and what happens? I can climb the tree. Yes, I can still, okay? I can climb the tree and get that nice, juicy red apple. And I can give that to her. I can offer that to her. I can, I can do the work in, in, in offering that to her. You know what Reagan can do? She can walk away. She can drop it. She can spit at the apple. 
She can, she can do all these different things. I've, I've never known her to spit, so don't teach her how to do that yet, okay? All right, nursery workers, don't teach my daughter how to spit. But, but when, you, when you think of it like that way, you get the illustration, the Holy Spirit is acting as the dad in this sense. And we are acting as the incapable child. We must ask God. Have you ever asked for this? God, will you give me patience? No, we don't ask for that. <laughs> and yet we ask for other things that requires patience, right? God, can you, can you give me love? It's not something that I can find within myself, not something that I can use self-effort in order to produce. I need this from the God of love because he is love. God, I need goodness. God, you are good. And he grabs that fruit. You get my illustration? Handing it to me. And then what happens? Then that can affect me, but then I can, I can also affect other people, can't I? Because as Christians, we're supposed to be givers. We're supposed to not only be affected, but then affect as God has affected us. How do we love others as God's commanded? He says, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second command. Now, the third command is what? Love one another as I have loved you, right? When he talks about this new commandment I give you, Jesus gives it in John. He says, what is he talking about? He's talking about the church. He says, this is how they will know you are my disciples if you have love one towards another. Oh, it's a one another from today. So us being affected by God is changing us inwardly, that inward transformation. It's not conformity where God's affecting us and it's just all on the outside and we're all show. It is inwardly transforming us, renewing our mind, as it says in Romans chapter 12, renewing our mind so that we can affect others. This is a passive fruit that is given by the Holy Spirit so then we can be who we're called to be. It's, it's, it's living in holiness. It's, it's the Christian life, practically speaking. These are God traits. I've got a couple of verses for you in Hosea chapter 14 and verse 8. And we don't have a super amount of time because I've got several verses here. So if you want to write these down and then read it from the screen, that would be wonderful. And in, in Hosea chapter 14 and verse 8, Ephraim shall I say... What have I do any more with idols? So they're saying, what, what do I got to do with any, any more idols, right? I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. What is it? God's telling them, hey, you want to know where your fruit's coming from? God. You go on into John 15. John 15, verses 1 through 8. It's just a beautiful beautiful passage here. It says, I am the true vine and my father is a husbandman. Who's, who's talking? Jesus. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. He taketh it away. How many of you love dead branches on your bushes? Okay. On your trees. Maybe some of you don't care and, 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 and it shows in your landscaping. But those who take pride in what they're doing in their landscaping, they will go out and prune the, the, the uh, uh, non-producing, non-green, the, the, the dead. And that's what he's, exactly what he's saying. Those who are not in the vine, and they're not bearing any fruit, God clears it out. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purchases it that it may bring forth fruit more fruit. There's, there's going to be some difficult times in your life. Pruning it is essential in your life. God will, will take away at times and then he will give. And, and, and it says, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So the word of God needs to be involved in our lives, right? 
And it says in verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Absolutely nothing. nothing. If a man abide not, in me. He is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gathered them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. You have to be in the fine. When you're sourced in the vine, Jesus Christ, that's when things happen. If we're not doing that, that's why things aren't happening. You ever wondered why things aren't happening in your life? Have you ever been in a season where there's just nothing, there's nothing going on and you're thinking, God, what's going on here? I wonder how much we have invested ourselves in the true vine. So are you sourcing the vine, as John 15 states? Okay, like I said earlier, it starts with God, affects the inward, and moves outward. It's by transformation, not conforming. And you know, you will be known by your fruits. Another verse here is Matthew 7, 16 through 18, a couple of verses. You shall know them by their fruits. You remember when I said that walking in the Spirit is evident? People will know. People will know. You know, it's, it's interesting when Pastor was talking this morning about accountability. How many of you like accountability? When it works. But you know when you're not walking in the Spirit and accountability is supposed to be working? It's really annoying, as he stated. Then all of a sudden when pastor texts you, calls, hey, I haven't seen you for four weeks. What's going on? You okay? Oh, pastor's at it again. He's on me. He's on me. I can't believe it. He's on me. Oh, man. He's so manipulative. Have you ever been there? I can't believe he's asking me about my walk with God. How dare he? Who does he think I am? I'm I'm, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I sing in the choir. I vacuum on Thursdays. Or the robot does it for me. One of the two, all right? I I just... ah, ah. You shall know them by their fruits. You know, accountability is one who comes out and says, I care about you, so I'm worried. I'm I'm concerned about you when you're choosing not to assemble with the believers like the scripture states. And you know, it's interesting. It's interesting. I stated this this, this morning in Sunday school, I said, you know, I wonder what would have happened if my parents would have stopped bringing me to church when I was 13 years old. Because I didn't get saved till I was 15. I wonder if they just got busy with life. Oh, they're tired because it's their only day to sleep in. Oh, I've got to go this place and I've got to go that place. I mean... You're okay with that, Pastor, right? I mean, you're concerned about my well-being. If my parents would have stopped bringing me to church and would have stopped bringing me to Sunday evening church on November 27th, 2005, that probably would not have happened. I'm just thinking about that because that was a Sunday evening service. Oh, that's just, that's just the assistant pastor preaching. 
he probably doesn't know what he's talking about. We can throw out all kinds of excuses, can't we? I was, I was expecting the church to be full tonight after this morning's message. And yet, there's some empty pews. You say, you're, you're just so mean, Pastor. You're, you're, you're putting the pressure on. I'm just thinking, I'm just, I'm just thinking about what God's commanded us to do. It's right there. You'll know them by their fruits. People know in the community when that parking lot on a Sunday evening is less full or on a Sunday morning it's less full they know they know when they see someone who should have been in church or they knew to be used to going to church right and yet they're in Walmart during the service they know or the restaurant at 11 o'clock Whoa, man, their pastor's done already? What? What happened? They know. They know. How come, how come the world can know us by our fruits, but we're confused about that? We're super confused. Why, why do we get confused? Because we want to just be wishy-washy that's, that's our excuse, right? You'll know them by their fruits. You can finish out the rest of that uh, passage later. It talks about some other things in, in, in describing more. But the fruit here is singular. Why? When it was called the works of the flesh, the lusts of the flesh was plural. Well, you know, the beauty of all of these fruit of the Spirit here, the beauty of it all, is that every single one of these can be bestowed to you at the same time. I don't have to be a one fruit wonder. Every single one of these can be invested in my life. That's the beauty of it. Well, love is my spiritual gift. Well, all of these can be the spiritual fruit in your life all at once. You go through here, and, he's, and he names off the first one. And by the way, this is not exhaustive. Again, but you go in here, and it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love, the agape love. It's, it's a, a willing, self-giving service. It's thinking elsewhere than self. That is opposite of the world. It's crazy. It's crazy for people to be acting this out. This love, 1 John 3, 16 and 17, it says, Hereby we perceive the, we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. So he says, this is the outworking. We've seen God display this. Jesus laid down his life for us. He showed us this agape love. And yet we should be willing to give it all. We should be willing. Oh, yes, I'm willing. But you know, in the next part of that, it goes, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Oh, I'd be willing to give anything and everything up for God. We can claim it, but we better act it out. In the everyday way of living, when we have and we see a need, we fill it. Because you know, God, God always fills that bucket right back up. It's a beautiful thing. There's love. Willingness to give everything, but proven by the everyday opportunities. You go into joy. Joy. Feeling of happiness based on spiritual realities. That means that I am resting in what God has done for me. And because of that, circumstances don't change my joy. Possessions don't change my joy. My feelings don't change my joy. Because salvation is not a feeling. It is a fact. Amen. Write that in your Bible if you need to. Salvation is not a feeling. 
it's a fact. And so you have this joy, 1 Peter 1, 8, it says, Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. We haven't seen Jesus in person, and yet we believe. And we have, have this, this joy, this joy unspeakable. I, I, I don't even know how to explain it, but it's a wonderful thing because I'm resting in God and what he's done for me. Peace. That's the next one. Exhilaration of heart from being right with God. Uh, salvation brings tranquility, okay? We're not doing yoga here, all right? But it's, it's that peace of mind, that peace that passes all understanding. You see in John 14, 27, it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, troubled neither let it be afraid. If anybody from this world comes and offers you and says, hey, 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 we can secure world peace. They're a liar. If somebody in this world comes and says, hey, I can give you peace. If it's from them, they're a liar. You know where you find peace? In Jesus Christ. That's where it's found. Because if you're trying to find it within a human being, if you've got some uh, self-help speaker out there, or some motivational speaker where I'm putting all my peace on him, guess what happens when he messes up? I don't have so much peace anymore. This is the peace that passes all understanding. It's more than any man could give. It's through Jesus Christ. Long-suffering. It's accepting situations that are irritating or painful. Have you ever had an irritating situation in your life? Painful situation? The long suffering, it means exactly what it's saying. Long suffering. No thought of retaliation in the midst of that. Long suffering. This one's tough. Anybody agree with that? Anybody want to confess with me? Okay, tonight? Okay, thank you. One in the back. All right, great. This one's tough. And yet in Colossians 3, 12 through 13, it says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. And I love the next part of this, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. You know what? That long-suffering has an effect on how we forgive others. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Christ being the example. Gentleness, it's a kindness, tender concern for others. And you say, well, pastor, you tell us to suck it up buttercup all the time. You know my heart. You know, some of the toughest guys that might scare you when you meet them for the first time can be some of the biggest teddy bears that you could ever find. This kindness, tender concern for others. I don't care how big you are. If you're six foot 17, it, it doesn't matter. You can still be gentle. First Thessalonians 2, 6 through 7 says, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Here it is, Paul. Paul's been a little bit rough on some people, including in Galatians, and yet he's come in, he says, I have been as a nurse to her children. Gentle. Goodness, moral excellence, working itself out. Galatians 6.10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Well, what if they're not wearing a mask, or what if they're wearing a mask? Deal. Get over it. Suck it up, buttercup. There you go. I mean, please. Jesus died so that they could wear a mask or not wear a mask. What? 
you're crossing over into the political realm now. Back off, bro. Jesus died. Jesus died so that we could not treat them like we were a sinner, but to love them and be good to them. Faith, loyal and trustworthiness. God is enough. In, in verse 10, Luke 16 and verse 10, it says, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is also unjust in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon who will commit to your trust the true riches. Verse 12, and if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is of your own? Even the little things, I need to be faithful in the little things. Faithfulness. Meekness, humility, while being free from any desire for revenge or retribution. Again, it's, it's, it's that humility, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. I love this. Jesus proves himself. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Don't you like that statement? So as we learn from God, as we learn from Jesus Christ, we go on and we need to be meek in our own ways. It says in verse 21 of James 1, it says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness, humility, the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. It's able to save your souls. And then temperance, self-control, 1 Corinthians 9, 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate, in all things, self-controlled. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. He was talking about the athletes obtaining their, their, their crown that's here on earth, and here we have this incorruptible crown. Self-control that's motivated by the finish line. Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. He's saying all these things that cannot be self-effort fruit, it is the Holy Spirit who gives us this fruit. But he goes on in the last part of verse 24 and, or 23, it says, against the, such there is no law. All these things, no one wants to put a law against these things. They're actually welcoming it. Even those who don't love Jesus, who, who claim that there is no God, they welcome you to do these things. And it says, verse 24, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. Doesn't mean that it's, it's gone, but yet we have the option to say no to our flesh to identify with Jesus Christ. And in, in, in verse 25, it says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You say crucify. What does that mean? You go into Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the, the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am identifying with his crucifixion. I am putting to death all the things that I did before. I don't want to do those anymore. I want, I want them to be off the back burner. There's no secret tunnels to it. I'm kicking it from the screen, the, the, the screen because, because Jesus gives me the power to do so. I can say no to that. And live being resurrected. Live in the Spirit. And that last part, if we live in the Spirit, let us all also walk in the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit was good enough to, to, to be a part of your salvation, your initial salvation, your justification, He's good enough to be able to be a part of your sanctification. He said, I got saved with the Holy Spirit convicting me of my sin and pushing me to righteousness, that calling, that power of the gospel upon my life. And now that same Holy Spirit, which was a part of my salvation, is living within me. And I don't act, have to act like somebody who's dead. I can act like I'm alive in the Spirit. I can walk it out. I can walk in the Spirit. So let's do it. Can we make that commitment tonight? Let's do it.